Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I'm Darren, I'm your host, and today I welcome back Kevin Liddell and Lloyd Capuccio, and we're going to talk about cooking thermometers, why you need them, what they're used for, and which ones you need to have. I'll be right back with Lloyd and Kevin. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter, sous vide and chilling from fire and water. Hey all, I want to introduce you to a company I just started working with, Fresh Jack's Organic Spices out of Jacksonville, Florida. They're a small, family-run company that's fast-growing. I've tried a bunch of their different seasoning blends and spices, and I can tell you they are all fresh, all organic. None of them contain artificial flavors or sweeteners. None of them have anti-caking agents or preservatives. They all taste like they were just made for you yesterday. Check them out, guys. They're on Amazon in the link below. They have different sample packs, different blends. Like I said, they also have the individual seasonings and spices as well. Fresh Jack's Organic Spices. Check them out, guys. I love them. <laughs> hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I am Darren. I am your host. And today, oh, yeah, I got the dynamic duo of Lloyd Capuccio and Kevin Liddell back. We are going to talk about thermometers and why you need to use them, all the different kinds that are out there, why they're important, why if you don't use any kind of thermometer in your cooking, you're probably burning stuff and not making the best food you can make. So Lloyd, welcome back. You are the Thank first because you. you're the biggest. That's true. I am. I think I got the biggest head too. Yeah. Lloyd yeah. is the kosher <laughs> dosher. The kosher dosher blog. He is in all the Facebook groups that have anything to do with sous vide. You'll see his posts that are usually about, you know, an hour to read them when he's, when he posts <laughs> up something, he's got 462 pictures of everything he's ever made. And, um, Lloyd that goes big time into uh, a lot of his, uh, cooks, Kevin Liddell of sous vide food and fun. Welcome. Howdy. Welcome. Good to be back. He is in the cold uh, area of Pennsylvania, Northern Pennsylvania. And, uh, he's, uh, you know, been locked up in his house for the last year with COVID and his hair is getting really, really long. So welcome, Kevin. And I'm not getting any skin here. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not either. Well, I'm trying, but we'll see. We'll see how this keto does. Keto works. It works, but it's awfully expensive. I'm, I'm finding that out. If I want to make anything that's got any kind of bread or anything, it's, if you buy any bread or uh, try to make it, buy the flour and stuff, it's they charge you an arm and a leg for it. Let's talk about thermometers. Why they're important? Why why you should use one? And um, you know what what they can help you do when you're cooking. Even the, even just the regular everyday home cook needs to have at least an instant read. Wouldn't you agree, Lloyd? Absolutely. I've been using one for God thirty years. Uh, I did. I used to use the analog one. To take five seconds for the, the little dial to move. You know, but. Uh, very important for precision cooking. I use it all the time. Love How it. about you, Kevin? I got several. Kevin, yeah, you've I... been cooking for a while. You cook professionally and you were catering and all that. How long was it when you were using instant reads? Oh, I've been using them. I mean, I remember my father when I was a kid using one that was stuck in the turkey all the time when he did turkey for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, it probably wasn't probably off by 10 degrees, but he always used one. Uh, and then when I started cooking professionally, I always had, you know, one or two on my sleeve or hanging on my collar. Um, those are mostly analogs. I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I was, I was actually in, uh, I think I was in, I was in culinary school when those, uh, those uh, digital ones that had the wires and the probes that you could use outside of the oven, you know, uh, first came out and those were kind of groundbreaking, pretty cool. Uh, I used those for quite a bit. I had a bunch. They never lasted very long, especially in a professional setting. Uh, so I always had those analog ones. I still have, I probably have 20 or 30 analog, those little, you know, pencil type analog ones. And, and those work fine. You know, they're cheap. You can get them for like five bucks. Uh, I have a few digital ones that are relatively good and they're easy to calibrate. You calibrate them in ice water and, uh, and the, you know, just keep them calibrated and they're, and they're as good as anything else, but there's so many new 
thermometers out there these days with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all sorts. I mean, the, the technology now is just amazing. Yeah, when I when I was cooking professionally in restaurants, it was in the mid to late '80s, early '90s. We really didn't use them much in the uh, in the uh, kitchens then because the really the only ones that they had were the you know crappy digital ones, and they really didn't work that well. Um, they got better over time, but we still, when we were cooking, you know, try to cook the steaks medium rare and stuff, we were doing the old, try to touch it, you know, to see, see how you know, springy it was and all the other tricks that we could try to do to figure out and kind of tried to time it. But, um, you know, it was mostly guesswork, but, um, I, I remember when the, uh, you know, digital ones first came out and everybody was like, wow, these are pretty accurate and we really need it. Now you couldn't, you know, uh, I couldn't live without one. I've got one out in my grill area for outdoor cooking. And I got one inside. I've actually got two or three inside. So, I mean, if you don't at least have a good digital instant read thermometer, um, you really need to get one because it can help you, you know, make a lot better food. And nowadays that's what we're going to talk about too, is there's so many different ways you can use thermometers and, and especially with the you kind of hinted on it, Kevin, with the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. We can monitor stuff from not even being in the house anymore. Um, I know on the barbecue side, you know, we've had the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, um, you know, thermometers, and now we've got this you know, temperature controllers for smokers that are, you know, like the Kamado grills and and just a regular, uh, you know, wood-fired smoker. You can use a temperature controller that has a little fan that blows and keeps it going and controls the temperature so there's so many yeah, different I things that are out there now so yeah and um so what why is it so important to be able to monitor the temperature of your food and your ovens and your cookers consistent results quality replication quality replication being able to replicate the same thing over and over again it's not that difficult replication quality on, like get, kevin you, said you, 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 you can't write a blog post for like, you know, uh, a cook for an hour and a half and then just say just for better results. Well, it is. Well, it is quality, better results, being able to replicate something. So if you're telling somebody, I want you to make this recipe and you don't tell them what the internal temperature is going to be, that's a hit and miss. So if you say, look, I want you to make this right here. I want it to an internal temperature of 130 degrees and you're done. It's replication, accuracy, quality or product. Well, it's not, rock, me, it's not rocket, it's not rocket yeah. science. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's really the general thing would be for an everyday cook would be if you want to know exactly how done your steaks are when you're cooking a steak, you know, if you want a medium rare steak, you know, if you don't have a digital thermometer or instant read thermometer, how are you going to figure it out? Like cutting it open or kind of trying to guess. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a digital thermometer, you're, you're hitting the miss. You're just trying to time it you know and and those aren't really the best ways to do it so but also you know there's some things now that we know with you know pasteurization and all that you know the whole you don't have to cook chicken to 165 degrees anymore you know so you can kind of measure the temperature of your food and try to figure out the pasteurization and all that. Then I'm not even talking about just by wood using sous vide. I'm just talking about being able to monitor the internal and external temperature um, of your food. There's there's so many different ways that it can help you and set, instead of just knowing the exact doneness of a steak. So, well, I mean, <laughs> pastor, it it gives you the ability to replicate, like like uh, Darren said or uh, Lloyd said. Uh, now. If you go to a high-end steakhouse in this country, or you know, anyway, the guys in there, the the, the 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 cooks in there have been cooking. They're doing hundreds of steaks a day. I, I guarantee they're not sticking a thermometer in each no. steak to see what the internal temperature is. They're feeling it. These guys know what they're doing. They've been doing it forever. Um, but your average Joe isn't cooking two hundred steaks a day and doesn't have the experience. So they need something to be able to yeah get consistent results. And see where you know what the temperature of what they're doing is. So digital versus analog. I know that the older analog ones, I know the ones of the really cheap ones are very like Kevin, you kind of hit it on this. They're not always the most accurate. And they're really not some of them you can't even calibrate them. So you're they're kind of I guess it's better than having nothing, but um 
they take forever also let's not forget the dial moves and you're waiting the oven door is open you sit there, you're losing heat it takes seven or eight seconds for it to the dial in it's a pain in the ass yeah i yep, I, so. I i i used to use like i said i had some cheaper ones of course i mean there's some better of course the the like with anything the more you spend on something the better quality the tell true um barbecue thermometers especially you know that they have on on some of the smokers and stuff are a lot better than some of these really cheap chinese things that you know you can get for 10 bucks on amazon definitely you know so how they're made is always going to be a, a factor in how good they are but you know of course di digital is always going to be better because of the i just bought i just bought why well, I, I own the thermal works mark <laughs> four the reading i think is two seconds and I just bought uh, Inkbar. I think you put a link up there on your in your group. Um, it was like fifty percent off of the new Inkbar one. I just bought that too. So digital is the way to go. And you want a short time to read the temperature. Yeah, I think with the just like with everything that's you know cooking related, anything, anything related. Now the technology has gotten so much better on these products that um, and with that the technology getting better it gets cheaper so whereas you're seeing the thermoworks mk4 which i have myself you know those are the you know the standard you know they are the ones that everybody wants you know the professional ones and right. they cost 100 bucks you know the regular price is 100 yeah. bucks on them so they're kind of pricey and you can find lots of instant read thermometers on on amazon or uh you know, anywhere pretty much cheap, you know, the cheap Chinese ones, you can get them for 15, 20 bucks, no problem. But doesn't mean they're always that good. Like I said, you know, like you said, you know, there's some that they'll take five, five to six seconds to read. And, you know, they might be off by, you know, two degrees. So if you're trying to get something that's more exact, you know, you don't want to be two degrees off. That's for sure. Oh. You so also want close dur dur durability. Some of it's like, like the Thermoworks <laughs> is built for professional kitchens. Uh, it's waterproof, I believe. Uh, it has, you know, it's built to be beaten up. Some of these cheaper ones end up, you know, if you drop it in the sink, you're done. You know, it gets yeah. wet. It gets, you know, you leave it, you leave it sitting somewhere where it's too hot. Thing dies on you. You know, you end up buying new ones every week. So durability is a big my, issue too. Mine lights up. It glows in the freaking dark. It does everything. And I think yeah, I like cool. the the Thermo Works, the Thermo Pen MK4. There, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's got a lifetime warranty, if I'm not mistaken. So Ooh, I don't, it, I don't know. I know it's got a pretty big warranty because I've known guys that had them for like two or three years, and they've sent it back and gotten new ones. So, oh nice. Um, if it dies on its own, I, you know, if it's something where you drop it in a deep fryer, I'm sure they're not going to cover it. But um, if it just dies on its own for some reason, I think they do have a pretty long warranty. So it's just like anything. The better, you know, the better quality stuff's going to cost you a little bit more money. So. I kind of want to you know, go back into the instant read. So there's a million of them out there now. So there's really no excuse, even if you get a cheap Chinese one to just get something, to have something in your kitchen, in your outdoor patio so that you can use to monitor your food. So, you know, not all of and them are a hundred bucks. Yeah. And your pet also. I love being able to sit inside the house and wherever he's outside, I can monitor the temperature of the pit. That's kind of nice. Well, I'm just talking about instant reads. If you don't have an instant read, you know, they're, they're cheap enough now that everybody should be able to buy one mm -hmm. without going, Oh, I can't afford you. Yeah. You can't afford oh, the, the thermal works, the thermo pen because they're a hundred bucks, but you can get a, a decent one for 20 bucks. So um, if you don't have an instant read and, and know how to use it, then you really need to. So then we go into the uh, barbecue or oven type thermometers where you can monitor your food and the temperature of your grill, your smoker, your oven and all that. So um, those have become a lot more prevalent. A lot of the you know competitors and the barbecue uh, circuit and any kind of cooking circuit, you'll see them all over the place. Uh, and I don't think you really started seeing them till about eight or nine years ago where they started getting cheaper, where people started realizing that they really needed to be able to monitor and know what the temperature of the food in the pit was instead of just throwing something on there and letting it cook. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Back to being consistent, accurate results and the quality of the food you're producing. Especially in competitions. Oh, yeah. yeah. A few degrees would make a big difference. Yeah, that's um, one of the biggest things I've seen is in innovation in the last few years is the different kinds and different 
options and how many different probes you can get in those, the kinds of probes. And they're just like instant reads anymore. You can get cheap ones that cost you, you know, 20 bucks and you can get ones that cost you, you know, 200 bucks. And then nowadays they do more than just monitor the temperature you can get the actual controllers that control a fan that you can control your uh, outdoor smoker and, and charcoal or wood fired grill with them and uh, they do a lot more so um, all of these type of things have all these different you know probes and, and thermometers on them they're always monitoring something like i said they're monitoring this the temperature of the grill and they're monitoring the temperature of the food and some of these things with the controllers, you can actually be at Walmart shopping and control your smoker. You know, if you get a warning that the smoker temperature is at 300 and you want it to be at 275, you can adjust the fan to stop blowing and uh, it will drop the temperature down. So um, I, I, if you look 10 years back, you know, <laughs> I don't think I would have thought these things were going to exist back then. And it just uh, continues to get more and more. I'm amazed some of those are thick, some of those devices are actually allowed in competitions. Um, well, you know, they make it they make it grills. so much easier. They make everything so much easier. The first yeah, it, uh, competition pellet grill was the Fast Eddie, and the the, the pit masters with the uh, offset were really pissed off because people were bringing their Fast Eddie pellet smokers, plug them in, put their bracks of ribs in there and their brisk, and walk away for a couple hours. We'll go drink yeah. a beer. We'll go take well, a nap. <laughs> yeah, but I. I had the guy uh, from Barbecue Guru, and they they were the ones that first created the first barbecue pit temperature controller. I had and, it, by the way, in the original. Yeah, the one that they actually went out and started testing, they went to barbecue competitions and tried to talk to the competitors. And they would go, and all of the guys were like, that thing's never going to work. We don't need that thing. And uh, they said they finally got to one competition and one guy was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use it. You know, let me use it and try it out and test it out for you. And the guy loved it and came back and said, can you get me more of those? <laughs> and, uh, and they, then they said, okay, we finally got some They They were going to give up because the guy that invented it, he had some kind of valve company and, you know, they made these uh, valves for like steam or some, you know, industrial equipment. And he, he liked to cook and he figured oh, i'm gonna try to make this thing so i can control use these valves things so they used a totally different technology that they ended up actually selling but what, like i was saying he had all these people and these were competitors they're like ah oh, i don't need that thing you know that's like i don't know some of these old time chefs that you get that the poo poo sous vide they're, they're the yeah. same way ah i know how to read my pit i know how to look at food and know when it's done but you know, once you start using one of these and you can actually nail it down, I think people will start changing their mind. He said, now everybody uses them on the circuit. You know, back then it was just like, everybody's like, no, we don't need that. It's garbage. And then I guess it just took a couple guys winning <laughs> with, when they were using those because they were able to control their pit and control the, you know, monitor the temperature and all that, that they um, actually now everybody that's on the, if it doesn't have built in controls already, then they're using um, some kind of uh, pit controller on it. So you can also extend but, your cook. I don't, I don't know. Nice. Any, are there, are, I don't think sous vide's allowed in any comp in you know barbecue competitions or anything. I don't, I don't know any, any of them. No, you got to cook with fire. They won't allow it. Um, yeah. They do allow it in the state cookoffs, but I, I had the guy from the that put together the that started the state cookoffs on and. He said that it just you have run into a time factor because uh, when they the way the steak cook-offs work you don't bring your own food they give you the steaks so you oh. pick your steaks and you only have a certain amount of time i think they only give you like an hour and a half so they Ooh, don't give you enough time to really use cv to and they're all ribeyes so um that's not gonna work the, the way i they, just use a microwave but the way those competitions work, and I've, I've had a couple, you know, the, the barbecue experts and guys on, even with the barbecue competitions anymore, they, they kind of get condensed down to where they're looking for just a certain profile anymore. And everybody's using the same rubs, the same, you know, seasoning blends. They're trying to make everything look exactly the same instead of having creativity, like with the steak cook-offs now, they're all look round. Like if you look at what they put out, you would never eat that at a steakhouse. 
<laughs> because they got they got to have the grill marks and the grill marks got to be perfect and they got to be round so they don't even look like a ribeye steak well, anymore. It's like, like the chili cook-offs it. too. It's yeah. like the chili cook-offs too. All the meat's got to be cut one quarter of an inch so it cooks properly. When they add the spices, yeah, I, I don't like yeah. chili cook-offs. They suck. They make it, they make it to where every, everybody has to pretty much produce the same type of food mm-hmm. and it's doesn't make it fun so so now we move into the technology still moving thermometers ahead just thermometers with the bluetooth and the wi-fi so now we got the you know we can control our smokers from you know shopping at walmart we can control you can monitor the food temperature wherever we are and now we've got the little um wi-fi and bluetooth single thermometers that aren't wired at all like the meter the meat stick um there's a bunch of those now i guess the patent must have ran out to whoever had it <laughs> because now you got yumley's got one you got uh tapa q has one and everybody's starting to come out with these um bluetooth wi-fi just the probe itself so you can put them in a rotisserie and all that and now you can monitor instead of having to stop your rotisserie and stick your instant read in there you can have a, a probe in there the whole time and monitor it via your phone app as well um i I don't know i think once you every time every once in a while i'll look around and i'll go what else can they come up with and then they come up with something different (laughs) some of them can go into deep fryers which amazes me yeah the meat stick is actually you can put in a deep fryer it's 100 percent waterproof so i can stick it in my sous vide bag and i've done that a few times now the i think they're still working on that technology because those are really, really tiny, you know, chips that are in there and they got to, you know, make them so where they can actually, you know, survive the heat and all that kind of stuff. And so I think they're going to be nothing but getting better and better. And that leads us into talking about, you know, I just had my podcast with Chris Young and his new product. Chris Young was the CEO of Chef Steps, made the jewel and um, he actually helped write modernist cuisine books and, all that he's been big into the modernist type cooking and the and actually technology in the cooking uh, industry. They're coming out with a new um, thermometer. He's working on Combustion Inc. That's got eight temperature probes on this little Wi-Fi, you know, wireless stick, where you can actually measure the temperature of the the surface of the meat, the internal, and your ambient temperature of your cooker and all that. So I think that's that's the next thing that's coming. So what do you guys think of something like that? Oh my I god, think it's brilliant! I can't wait till it comes out. I asked Chris. I, uh, uh, Chris and I had an email dialogue. And I asked him, "What are you designing the new oven for Bravel?" He says it's down the road. He's hoping. So I want the oven that he designs. I think that the fact I don't know. I mean, I, I I'm trying to figure out how they fit eight sensors into that. A uh, tiny little probe. Uh, it looks like it's only, you know, what three inches long, maybe. I don't. You know, you know more uh, than I do. Yeah, I I know he's got a working prototype, and I don't know. He said they're going to be able to release it for sale this year. Uh, that may be later. It could be December. It could be, you know, I you know how those things work. There, he hasn't decided if they're going to do a Kickstarter. I think he's got the money to just be able to put it together and um, and do it um on its own i don't think he has to do a kickstarter on it but uh, because it looks like they've already got a lot of the a lot of it already done he said he was supposed to take this year off or last year off but he ended up you know working a lot more than he was hot you know wanted to so um i think that they've got some things that he's thinking of and where he's going to next is going to help a lot of the stuff like that's been coming out, like with the Innova precision oven, you know, one of the things that I like about that oven is that it does have a, a, a internal probe you can use inside the oven. It does have the steam function. So you can actually um, monitor your food in there like you would in a, in a sous vide or in, in a smoker and control it and, and do some things like we're going to talk about Delta T cooking here in a minute. So you can use that, but one of the things that doesn't do is monitor the temperature of the uh, surface of the meat, which, which is one of the things that me and Chris were talking about that really can 
help you out a lot more and be able to uh, monkey around with the temperatures of the, the oven and making sure you don't overcook your meat a lot, a lot more. That's what makes his product different is the ability to, you know, the sensor to, to tell you what the surface temperature of the food is. None of the others can do that as far as I know to this point. So I think that's what really sets his apart. Yeah. And, and I don't think a lot of people understand it. You really don't need to understand it, I guess, if you don't want to, but it does help you if you're trying to perfect, you know, something, uh, most, even just the, uh, instant read thermometers, just read the inside of the meat. And that's the last, like he said, that's the last thing that the temperature changes at is the inside. So you are wanting to know what the doneness is. So you can, you, but if you can know what the surface temperature is, because the surface temperature is different than what the inside of your oven or your smoker or the surface that you're cooking on is. So you, you really, if you can understand how the different temperatures work in conjunction with each other, you can actually uh, do some things with the, the temperatures of your cooker and, and monitoring that you couldn't do any other way. So I'm really looking forward for that thing to come out so I can, play around with it as well chris young did a video on how to do that he explained all the science and the how to and why it works on a tweet i believe so it's also a combustion inc i believe.com here's a video it explains all that you know service temperature humidity ambient temperature internal temperature and how to actually cook a protein in your oven that that mimics sous vide or sous vide like results pretty interesting yeah yeah and that's that's some of the things that i'm looking forward to playing around with and there's you know people like us that are food geeks that like doing this stuff but most people don't they don't have the time for it they just want you know half the people you know order uber eats or they stick something in the microwave or they <laughs> heat up a frozen dinner you know and they're happy with it or they order the uh you know home gourmet boxes <laughs> <laughs> and follow the instructions, you know, and they don't really want to think about too much, but you know, people like us that really want to understand the whys and the hows and, and be able to perfect something. We're always tinkering. We're always playing with new, new things and, and learning new techniques and methods and tips and tricks. That's why a lot of us are into sous vide and, but your most average guys, you, know, you start talking about sous vide and their eyes glaze over and they, they're, cross and they don't want to hear or if they complain <laughs> and say that takes too long like i posted some photographs of my my sous vide burger and i said how it took you know two hours and 45 minutes to pasteurize 10 minute rest good sear oh why would you want to do something like that when i can have a burger in eight minutes and it's not only that you still got people that will learn sous vide and then now you introduce the the probe for like like on the on the hydro pro you know, you show them something, well, hell, this has got a probe now where you can monitor the internal temperature while you're using your sous vide. And they go, well, why would you need to do that? You, oh my God. you know, so you get that. So <sighs> it's not just, you know, on, on barbecue or whatever. It's no matter, whenever you introduce something new, you're always going to have somebody that gets going to poo poo it and go, that's just a marketing ploy. And that's what I've heard. I heard people say, well, that's just really? a marketing ploy. You don't need to do that. Well, okay, it's not really a marketing ploy, especially with the Breville. They're, they're selling it to restaurants and commercial kitchens that actually yeah. need, it, need it to monitor for HACCP and all that. But there's certain things you can do with it when you do monitor the internal temperature because you don't know what the internal temperature is unless you monitor it. You're guessing, you're doing an algorithm, you're trying to figure it out. You're you know, going by what somebody else might have did, you know, five years ago when Baldwin was doing his tests with lab equipment. And that doesn't mean every piece of meat, you know, cooks the same way. You know, you're just guessing, but, you know, but you have those type of people that would do that and go, well, what do you need that for? And it's just a marketing ploy. And it's, it's not really, they don't, and what my conversation with Chris Young was just, that was, he thinks, when he's trying new things, it's more of how to make things better. Not he, he's like anti putting together a product just to put a market, a product. It's not like I want to market a product to make money. It's I want to try to solve a problem. And the people that can't see the problems that these new products solve are just ridiculous to me. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> well, yeah. I, for example, I mean, I, I gave my sister a, uh, 
immersion circulator. I had cooked, I've cooked her before sous vide. Uh, and she always thought she was like, Oh, that's neat. You know, this turned out really well. Um, so I, I finally just gave her a circulator I had for Christmas. And I talked to her a few months ago and asked her if she ever used it. She was like, she said it was a very, she felt it was a very limiting cooking method. And then was talking about how, you know, she thinks she's doing so well during the pandemic cooking, you know, for herself and my nephews and keeping everyone fed all day long. And I was like, well, it's not, you know, you could do all that prep on Sunday and then just reheat stuff the rest of the week. Your life uh, would be so much easier. You could do it three to four weeks out. Yeah. And it's, it's just, you know, and then you just can, you can leave that circulator running all the time. And whenever you need something, throw it in, reheat it and then serve it, sear it and serve it. Easy peasy. I I talked to a person the other day about sous vide and I was talking about the advantage of the pasteurized chicken, for example, where you make, you know, 30 pieces of chicken, they stay in your refrigerator and extend the shelf life because of the temperatures in your refrigerator. And then when you want something like you just said, warm it up, throw it in the skillet, you're done. Oh, that seems like a lot of work. I said, what, you put, put it in the bath and walk away? Yeah, it's less work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I don't understand that, you know? Well, and that's the mentality with a lot of the barbecue guys when you tell them, you know, to eat and then smoke it. And they're like, 48 hours on a brisket. That's crazy. And it's like, why? You don't have to sit there and tend it like a fire like you do on your yeah. offset smoker where you have to actually got to stand next to it and feed it logs every, you know, 10 minutes or the fire goes You walk out. away. You, <laughs> you walk just away. Let, it sit, let it run for two days and come back and then take it out and put 42 pounds of ice like Lloyd does on it so it can chill. Hey y'all, it's Darren. I want to take a second to talk about ThermoWorks and their ThermoPen and ThermoPop instant read thermometers. They are the industry standard and industry leading, most accurate, most durable, most dependable on the market. You'll find these in most professional kitchens. The ThermoPen is accurate within a half a degree, under three second readout time, and is the most durable on the market. The Thermopop is a little bit more pocket friendly with about a five second read time, but still very reliable and dependable. Check out the Thermoworks products in the link below. All right, Lloyd, so you've (laughs) you've done, we've talked about ice long enough. All right, right. Lloyd, let's let's get into some technical stuff. And Kevin, you're gonna be in this too, but I just, I know Lloyd's kind of played around with this a little bit more, especially now that he's got the Hydro Pro plus there oh yeah, oh, yeah. <sighs> let's talk about the delta t cooking um i kind of talked about it a little bit with uh, david and kind of talked about it some and and some other episodes with some other people so let's talk about delta t cooking and what it is and when you are able to monitor your temperatures in the sous vide like you can and even in the uh, anova precision oven you can monitor your internal temperature while you're cooking um in a lower temperature why, what is Delta T cooking and how can it help you and what can it do for you? So Delta T cooking basically is um, having the bath temperature several degrees above above the desired core temperature of your food. So for example, um, your bath temperature may be at 136, but your desired protein core temperature is 133. The advantages of course is speed, textual differences, And what people don't realize is heat transfer occurs very, very slowly as the um, protein and bath start to equalize, come within one or two degrees, the heat transfer slows down dramatically. And by increasing your bath temperature just a couple of degrees, uh, it speeds up the process between 30 and 50%. And Kevin and I have been talking about this for several years now. People can't tell the difference between two or three degrees. I created a whole post around that. But more importantly, you can cook your protein a little faster uh, and some textual differences. And more, uh, I found, uh, I just said the other day, a little bit better fat rendering too. So my go-to for ribeyes have always been like 133, 134, depending on the quality. And I just did a fast cook on the Hydro Pro Plus where I used a 133.6, two Celsius degrees above the final core temperature of 133. And I got done in uh, three hours and five minutes and nine seconds, opposed to taking seven and a half hours. And I think produced better results with the shorter cook. And I lost, I believe, less moisture and I had better uh, fat rendering. 
And now, they're all now, awesome. would, Go ahead. now would you have um, better fat rendering internally as well, or is it mostly just the external fat? If you're doing like a um, roast or something like that, that has a lot of external fat on it. Well, I did a three pound, uh, it was a three pound ribeye. And, and based on the visual inspection, I thought that uh, the intra and uh, intramuscular fat rendered down very nicely. But unless you do a side-by-side -side test, it's really hard to quantify those results. So I don't think a whole ribeye, cut off steaks, and then sous vide them separately, be able to compare all of them together. But the Delta T is really beneficial for like uh, doing prime rib or rib roast. Like I did a whole post on that where not using Delta T, I think it took me, uh, I did 133 for 5.69 inch prime rib. It took over nine hours, I believe, to equalize. Where had I done, let's say, two to four degrees above uh, the desired core temperature, I could have cut the time in uh, probably 40 or 50%. And the advantages, of course, is better. I think you have um, more fat rendering uh, and textural differences. And like Kevin and I talked about, you can't tell the difference between 133 and 136. You, you cannot tell the difference. So yeah, I, I, I know... It. I know for a fact, like on prime rib, if you you know go from like a 132 to a 134 to 136, it's very hard to tell. If you put them side by side, you probably, you know, most people couldn't tell the difference. It would still be medium rare to them. And don't forget with Delta T cooking, you're you're not cooking one steak, let's say at 134, one let's say 130. You're using the the bath temperature might be set at let's say 136, but the desired core temperature is 132. So there's going to be a gradient that your eyes cannot detect. So the outer inches or half inch might be, let's say, 134. As you make your way to the center, it's 132. You can't see the, you can't tell the difference. You know, and Not, also the way it feels in your mouth is amazing. Another benefit that most people that aren't professionals aren't going to realize or necessarily want to know about is uh, the ability to get that whatever you're cooking from. Uh, refrigeration temperature up into uh, you know above like 125.6 in a quicker amount of time mm -hmm. uh, if, you can, if you can prove you know show that on a graph to your health inspector who wants a HACCP program and you can show that you know I did it in this amount of time as opposed to a longer amount of time it's going to make everyone happier uh, so you're, you're more likely to you know not have any issues from that end that's a good segue I was about to talk about that too <laughs> Basically, you have a large diameter protein like a prime rib. I had almost six inches, and getting above the 125.6 in kind of a, a, a fast way, uh, using delta T is amazing. Just it's fast, yeah. And uh, getting back to your point there, Kevin, I, I, a lot of home cooks, especially, don't understand that products like that, you know, Thermoworks has had CV, you know internal sous vide thermometers for a couple of years now and they've been marketing them to restaurants and, and food service kitchens I have, those and, too. I have those too yeah but i mean they've been out there it's not like hydro no. you know the poly science <laughs> was was something coming out with something new but it, i mean these have been out there for a while and they're out there for a reason they're not out there just you know like i said when i had somebody on my facebook group so oh, that's just a marketing ploy by poly science it's like the hell are you talking about that's because you know have no idea what the hell you're talking about but it's 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 so that you know they can monitor there is still a reason to monitor an internal temperature of food even though you're using sous vide whether it be for HACCP plans for the health and you know health departments because you know a lot of people don't understand using sous vide in a in a restaurant setting or a commercial kitchen is a lot different than using it at home you know you don't have the health inspector coming in your house and asking you you know, the temperature of your food all the time because you're not serving it to strangers. <laughs> you know, I did a, a few years back, I did a salami. I, I used my, my Thermoworks uh, sous vide probes and uh, I want to say the casing was like five and a half inches. And um, I only used like a two or three degree uh, Delta T back to what Kevin says, trying to get the internal temperature up a little faster. But the other day I did, uh, using the Hydro Pro Plus, I did a, uh, 120 millimeter uh, casing. I think that's like 4.75 inches, maybe. And I use a 10 degree Delta T, 10 degrees. That seems like a lot, but not in a salami. I did uh, 158 until uh, 148. And it took like, uh, I believe, three hours and change, or opposed to, let's say, nine to 12 hours. 
I saved like probably eight hours uh, with this salami. And I did a almost a five inch salami in three hours and change with a 10 degree Delta T and, and it came out flawlessly. Just now with, you with cannot tell the difference. Would the texture on something like that be affected as much as like on the ribeye though, or is that just more time savings? Time savings. Um, also, uh, um, I sliced it on my deli slicer and you could not tell the difference. You just cannot from, from the outer edge to the center. You, there's no difference visually or, or, or textually. You, there's no difference at all. 10, 10 now, degrees is very, very little. I'm going to try some Delta T on, on some, um, salmon and fish. Cause I, when I, from what David told me at poly science is that it's, you know, tender, you know, things like that are really where it kind of can help you out a lot as well. Yeah. But the, the difference is that, uh, the, the fish thing, um, tends to be a pretty dramatic difference. Like he's probably talking about putting it in our, at, in two separate, <coughs> excuse me, in two separate water baths. Um, the original one's probably around 183 degrees and the second's probably 132. So you're getting That's different. What, what you're talking about, Kevin, is, is something that they said two water baths. What David said specifically on one of his videos, 183, like you just said, but putting a probe in there, but pulling it out. So 183 bath probe in there. When it hits like 115, pull it, you're done. Yeah. There's yeah. no, there's no re redoing no. it. It's just, it's done when it, and it's, it's done. It's supposedly it cuts down, you know, on the uh, alubilum or whatever the, what is that? Albumin. It's approaching. Albumin. I can't pronounce it. Albumin. Yeah, there we go. Albumin. It cuts albumin. down on the albumin and it makes the texture just like. I need phenomenal. to try this. Yeah. But you didn't have to get like a, what, a one inch piece of salmon to really make a difference. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I've, I've, I've it had, works great. I bought, I, I bought salmon the last few times I was at Costco, but I couldn't find a really thick piece. So, Because you guess you got to have a pretty good thick piece in order to do it. You don't really want to do it with an inch. Yeah. yeah. At least an inch. Who am I trying it with tuna? It works great though. Have you tried it? Have you tried it with tuna before? Tuna, no, I, I, no, I, I, I'm when I do tuna, I, I do a maximum of like one ten. I know, um, right? So I like it, tuna, done. Yeah, yeah, it, it's done. I'm not. Yeah. I wouldn't sous vide tuna myself either. I'm just a quick sear on each side and. Yeah, have it nice and raw in the middle. <laughs> it's like sashimi. So, what else can Delta T help you do better, or um, how else can you use it to um, to make better food? I like. I think David uh, from uh, Poly Science said it the best: textual differences. You know, people always like when sous vide first started, or the last, let's say, five years, newbies. Look at this. I got pink all the way through. Well, sometimes it's nice to have textual differences, you know, the way it feels when you bite into it. So textually, I like um, some differences, like the ribeye. You know, I posted pictures of that. You can actually tell the difference in texture when you're chewing it. it had a great chew to it. Just a wonderful chew uh, to it. So textual differences, uh, not visually, but textual differences and, and bringing the core temperature up a little faster for us to save time. And like Kevin alluded to, getting above the uh, 125.6 is as, as to that's one of the pasteurization points uh, there is. So it's I also very useful. Pay. It's very useful for restaurant applications when you're, you know, passive, passive, when, passive. When yeah. You, yeah, but plus t the time saving. Uh, yes. You know, if you get in and, you know, it's sometimes you, you, you get in at noon and you got to start serving at five and maybe you, you know, you don't have eight hours to sous vide. A bunch of product so you can do it in three hours or four hours and you're good to go i'd also add for your viewers sometimes just because you're doing delta t doesn't mean that the protein doesn't need to stay a few extra hours at the core temperature to tenderize so let's say you had um a chuck roast a chuck roast pretty let's say you have a substantial chuck roast um and we know that chuck roast can take you know 36 to 40 hours to cook, but it could take a very long time for it to equalize in the bath. So you might consider doing a delta T and then once it reaches that core temperature, lower the bath temperature down and hold it at that temperature for an extended period of time until it tenderizes. So you can save time, but also tenderize at the same time. 
Yeah. It's, and something on something like that too. And I think a lot of people, and I had somebody bring this up to me and one of the other groups, when I posted, I did a, I did a Delta T and it was only like two or three degrees higher than my target. And then I lowered it and they're like, well, that's not really Delta T. It's only two or three degrees. It's supposed to be like four to eight or whatever. Oh my God. You know, it's, when people get into minutia like that, and it's like, no, really, I was doing a 48 hour cook. So I Delta T it to get it up to my target. Yes. Then I dropped the temperature down. So I only had to drop the temperature two or three degrees. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. I was tenderizing. I didn't know Delta T was, I didn't know Delta T was defined as eight degrees. Oh my God. <laughs> well, yeah, it was like, oh my you God. Know, just because he probably read an article where somebody did it like that. And now of course, all of it's got to be like that, but you know, it could be anything over the, the temperature, your, your, your target temperature. It could be one degree and still be Delta, Delta T. T faster. Yeah. So. Well, I plan on doing a couple of different ribeyes, you know, and, and I'm curious to know if I can go to a butcher and get, let's say, two or three ribeyes, I'd like to be able to cook one Delta T, exactly the way I did it before, hit Delta, hit my desired core temperature, pull it out, lower the bath temperature, and then put it back in for another two hours and, and play around with the different temperatures to see what I like. Again, it's personal preferences, you know, what, what you think is a good texture. Yeah, and that's the fun part of experimenting. But um, one and of eating. the things when I was, yeah, when I was uh, talking, you know, addressing the one guy that was giving me garbage, it's like you realize that to get that last two degrees on a long cook, you know, especially on something like a big oh. thick brisket or something like that, it takes a long time for that last two degrees to go. So even if you're only two or three or four degrees higher, it's still, you're going to get there quicker and you know, you can lower it and still keep it in the bath because it's still not going to move as much. So, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, people get kind of crazy and, but I think also people don't understand that doing a, something that's only cooking for two or three hours and you're able to cook it and, you know, or for three hours, you can cook it for two hours or what have you is different than cooking it for 48 hours and being able to cook it in 36 and get the same results. So it all depends on what you're cooking, what the thickness is, you know, and, and the, the type of protein or food you're cooking. Like I, I wouldn't gonna suggest work... a Delta T for a New York steak, you know, I would yeah. suggest, it. but you know, for like a, a two and a half inch ribeye, you know, or, or a chuck roast or a primer that's pretty, pretty thick. Or, yeah. Well, I do it on a New York strip just for the time savings because I usually do New York strips longer than I do a ribeye, you know, because I want it to tenderize. So yeah, I would it, do it so I could get to the core temperature a little bit sooner and then let it ride. But, well, I'm talking like a New York strip that may be an inch thick. Oh, yeah. Those I mean, I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like a two each steak, those. Yeah. Oh, my God. I love big old thick steaks. So a New York yeah. definitely needs. That's why I cut my hours. own. I cut my own steaks. I don't buy the you know, thin crap that they cut at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. So what about for vegetables? Any reason to do vegetables that way? Since they cook usually pretty quick at a high temperature anyway. Uh, you know, I'm not a big vegetable guy. You know? I don't, so, I'll tell you what, I like I'm, cooking vegetables sous vide, but you I gotta do. cook them at a high temperature because a, six at least. Yeah, I cook them in there because a I don't have to boil them or steam them where it's removing a lot of the flavor, and 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 c I can cook it to where it's still crisp and it's still got a bite to it. It's not soggy and all that, and I know that it's not going to overcook. So that's why I do it. I, I mean, I'm not trying to tenderize so. it. Or, yeah, because I've never uh, I've never actually heard of anyone probing vegetables. <laughs> To be honest, yeah, I don't, like I said, I, I don't think it. I don't think it would make a difference. I mean, if you're, you really because you're cooking you at such do. a hot temperature anyway, and you know, two or three so, degrees is not going to really bother me. If I cook them at, at one eighty eight instead of one eighty six, it's not going to bother me anyway. Well, to cook a vegetable to break down the structure is between like one eighty six and one ninety four. So whether you pull it at thirty minutes or thirty five minutes because of the you cooked a little higher, I, I don't see the benefit of delta T with vegetables at all. Yeah, I, I neither do I, and that's why I kind of brought it up because I want to make sure people uh, understand that it, it doesn't benefit everything. You know, there's certain things that it's not going to benefit. But all right, guys, so Delta T cooking, we're all going to start doing it more and more of it and start posting up about it, correct? Uh, me, yes. In fact, I'll be posting a my Villa Mortadella where I did a 10 degree Delta T. Guys, look forward to seeing it. We should be looking forward to seeing it. 
Kevin, how about you? Yeah, I'm definitely going to do some work. I, you know, I don't do it that often for myself because I have the time to just do equilibrium cook. Uh, but, you know, if I start writing up some, some, you know, doing some tests or that sort of thing, I'll definitely do Delta T stuff and play around with it. I've, I've done it. I just, I don't need to do it. Um, you know, but would that, I need to would that be something, it. would that be something you could be able to teach to your restaurants and stuff when you, when you get out there and, and start going oh. out and like you're wanting to do with the teaching them how to use the sous vide oh it's absolutely something that i would teach and and demonstrate i'd do a side by side have a couple tanks running and show them you know how how much of a difference it can make and say you know if you're in a time crunch and you need to get this done you know and you don't have 12 hours and you want to do it in six and this is how you do it and you're going to get good results and then actually demonstrate it to them uh it's a very useful thing it's for the home, the average home cook. It's not something that you know. I mean, I've got I've got the time to put something in the bath and just let it go and wait till it achieves equilibrium on its own. Uh, I don't need to necessarily measure it or probe it, but uh, doing it for you know teaching HACCP and safety stuff at a restaurant or a catering, then definitely something that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not really suggesting that home cooks need to be doing this stuff just to know that they can. I mean, people like me who are curious and, and, and Lloyd who likes to understand mm -hmm. how things work. I think it's good to be able to do this stuff. And then you, know, you can understand that, you know, the restaurants and commercial kitchens have a little bit different, you know, use for it than we would definitely because they have the health department and the HACCP plans they have to abide by. And it's, you know, be able to show the health department that you actually cook something for less time at the lower temperature and it's going to do nothing but benefit them. But it's something to where if, you know, food geeks like me want to play around with, we can, but I definitely don't want to say it's something you have to do. It's that it's just something cool that you can do that. Gee whiz. Can, it's like, wow. Gee yeah. Whiz. And you can get different results. Yeah. You can get some better results. You know, is it going to be something where the results this much different than, you know, not doing it? Probably not. It's probably, you know, I don't think anything that we do now, you know, really is huge, hugely different than something we could have done 10 years ago. It's just that we're able to monitor it better and we can, it's the little things, you know, it's like, even when I was talking to Chris Young, it's the, the more we can narrow down the, the gap of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, be able to get something, you know, a little bit better. It's always going to be, even though it's just a little bit better, it's still better, right? I think about where I started, you know, 11 years ago, 12, 13 years ago with Subi, 2008, and where I am today, I knew nothing. <laughs> Warm water, throw a chicken breast in there, a couple hours, oh, that's pretty good. Compared to where we are today, it's amazing. But you uh, know if what? You, if you, if you listen to uh, Chef, Chef Gerard from cuisine solutions he admits back when he started he didn't know what the hell he was doing and they were doing everything wrong they look he looks back at today and like boy we're lucky we didn't kill everyone yeah yeah and he said that on my podcast as a matter of fact and it's like but i think we all do that when we first when i first started doing barbecue you know who, who does a brisket for the first time and, and goes I came out perfect no problem you know yeah you and you learn from that now get out of here put your hand down lloyd you didn't you didn't do it but yeah, I mean, it, it, there's always a learning curve, but it's fun. I mean, you know, people like me like to learn. We don't just, we, of course, we'll look at things and try to um, try to do it as best we can, you know, the first time out, but we're always going to figure out something later that we can change and fix and make it better. I think what sets us apart is that, at least for me, I, I think it's a place you guys do. We enjoy the process. Right. I, I enjoy the process. I love it. That's funny. I just, it just reminded me of, I remember, I think I remember it was the first time I ever cooked sous vide. I put, I had a uh, baby, baby potatoes and I put them in with whatever meat I was cooking, at, you know, like 135 degrees and pulled oh. those out. And I, you know, raw, potato, and I, raw, potatoes. Raw, raw, raw potatoes yeah. for dinner. I was like, these potatoes didn't work out real well. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Learning curve. <laughs> Learning yep. curve. 
Well, and that's like, you know, you'll see people and you can tell the new ones because they'll put the whole rosemary and the butter and the, in their, in their bags. And you're like, you know, you're only putting the rosemary exactly where it touches the meat. Right. <laughs> so use powdered stuff. <laughs> Thanks guys for joining me. Let's uh, we'll, we'll do this again in another month or so. And uh, let's see if we can get uh, uh, Douglas uh, Cal- or Douglas Baldwin on Baldwin. Since he's your best buddy, Lloyd, let's see if we can get Douglas Baldwin would, on and answer some of our questions. Best buddy. But um, have you reached out to him at all? Have you no, reached out I to him? I think I'm letting you do that for us. So, All right, guys. Thanks for joining me. I look forward to the next time you guys are on. Hopefully, our listeners got some information that they're looking for, why they need to use at least an instant read thermometer at least. But, um, you know, there's plenty of thermometers out there that uh, – I, that's actually new technology coming out that i tell you what it's uh every time you turn around there's something new coming out but i'm looking forward to it thanks for joining me thanks kevin good being on for taking time out of your busy busy day and lloyd thanks, thanks again for wearing a shirt i'm just thinking about saying <laughs> all right bye guys <laughs> <laughs> thanks again i'll see you again on the next fire and water cooking podcast well all right guys thanks again for joining us on the fire and water cooking podcast make sure you follow us on facebook instagram make sure you follow us on the fire and water cooking youtube channel as well and i'll see you again on the next fire and water cooking podcast thanks guys